Well, good evening. Good to see. Well, that's bright up here, George. Wow. I've never, I've always, I can't even see you out there. I guess you're there. Uh, my eyes will settle in in a minute. I'm used to standing back there. So things, things have changed. Things are different since just being here last year. Now we're dealing with a, a worldwide, a global pandemic. We're wearing masks and we don't know if we should shake hands or bump elbows or hug or stay six feet apart. It's, it's different. It's different and it, um, it's been a challenge and it's a challenge for us in Cabot. I know it is here for you. And I got to tell you, I had other speaking appointments this summer and, and what happened was they called and said, hey, can you just send a video for us? And, and so that's been a challenge, you know, just doing the lesson on video and downloading and sending. So it really is, when I say it's good to be here, it really is good to be here. I'm glad I didn't have to send a video and I could actually come and be with you in person. There, there's just something um, about that. And I, I hope one of the things, and I've said this at Cabot, I'll say it here, I hope one of the things we've learned the last six months is how important it is for us to be together. You know, we, we take a whole lot for granted, and it's taken from us. And, boy, we, we need one another, and we need to be together. So I'm thankful we're able to be together tonight. Maybe you don't know the name Truman Scott. Truman has passed on to his reward. But Truman was the dean of students at Sunset when I was a student there. And he did nothing but show show us love by the way that he lived. It was obvious that he was in love with God by the way that he spoke about God, by the way he preached, by the way that he taught about God. I love to see him interact with his wife because he was so loving with her always and what an example he was to me as well as the other young men that were around him and watched him so closely. I knew that he loved me and I knew that he loved the other students as well by the way that he was gentle and encouraging with us. I never one time saw or heard of him losing his cool or his patience or acting in any way other than a loving way. Now, I know he had to deal with disciplinary issues like uh, all administrators who deal with students have to deal with, but he was always very loving. It was clear to me that Truman Scott knew Jesus and it showed in how good he was at living a loving life. What about you? What about you? Are you living a life of love? Is that your goal? Do you strive for that daily? Because we should. Galatians 5 and 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, and we can, we can recite them all, but he begins with love. And when he says the fruit of the Spirit is love and, and the rest of the character qualities, what he's saying is these are character qualities that should be present in every Christian's life because the Spirit indwells you. So you should have these qualities. They, they, they should be seen in your life by the way you live. In love, he mentions first. I find that interesting. Christians should live a life of love. And maybe you say, well, but how? What does that mean? What, is it, what does it look like to live a life of love? Well, I want you to turn your Bibles with me to 1 John 4. And we're going to begin there. And I'm going to share three things with you this evening. George said, you guys are used to getting out at 9 o'clock, so I will have you out by 9. No, I will have you out long before 9. I promise. So let's begin with this. Living a life of love begins with God. It just begins with God. That's, where, that's the bottom line. That's where we've got to start tonight. When we talk about living a life of love, it begins with God. In 1 John 4, let's just read verses 7 and 8, and we'll come back and forth to a few verses in this text periodically this evening. But John writes, Beloved, let us love one another. We'll talk about that in a little bit. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. He said, if you're talking about love, if you're talking about living a life of love, it begins with the fact that God is love and God has shown his love for us. 
it, I'm blown away when I hear people say, well, God could never love me. You don't understand what I've done. You know, and I, and I mean, I don't know their story, and I don't know all that they've done. I know what I've done. And, and I can tell you a string of things that other people have done. I can tell you the stories from the Bible of, of Paul, can't you? Saul of Tarsus, and, and so many others, what they did. But let me tell you something. When we question God loving us, we question His love, and we question the cross is what we question. Without God, there is no love. God is love, and He demonstrated His love at the cross, didn't He? Look at verses 9 and 10, 1 John 4, 9 and 10. In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. So God's, God loves us so much, He sends Jesus to be the propitiation, the, the substitution, if you will. Stand in our place at Calvary for our sins. Maybe the most quoted passage of all time speaks of God's love and the cross, doesn't it? God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. And what did He give His Son to, one might ask? He gave Him to death. He gave Him to the cross because of the way He loves us. In Romans 5 and verse 8, Paul would say, God demonstrates His own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So it's amazing love that we didn't have to clean ourselves up. We didn't really have to do better, so to speak. We didn't really have to earn it. He just demonstrated His love by sending Jesus to the cross even while we were a mess. That's love. And I'm not sure how you question that love. But when you, when you talk about living a life of love, you got to begin here. And see, we can back this thing up to the beginning, and we can see that God created Adam out of love and a desire for a relationship. I, I want to be clear. I don't know how far I can walk here, so if I get out of the, the range of the camera, just yell at me because I can't see you. Okay? I thought my eyes were going to adjust a little bit. Well, it's bright. I like it, but it's bright. Where was I? Okay, so... God creates Adam not because God needs mankind. He wants mankind. He wants a relationship with mankind. So he creates Adam to have a relationship with him. It's out of love. God loved Adam so much that he created from Adam a woman, a helpmeet, a wife for Adam. The most incredible relationship we experience in this world next to our relationship with God is our relationship with our spouse. There's no other more intimate relationship in this world than that of a husband and a wife. And it's from God because He loves us. So this love thing with God, we can go clear back to the beginning throughout the Old Testament history. All that God did for His people, Israel, was out of love for them. And maybe you would say, well, you know, his love for his people seemed absent at times. Remember they were taken captive? Well, let me suggest this to you. Tough love is love too. And, and sometimes God's love was tough love. And, and i got to tell you, sometimes our, lo our love as parents, sometimes our love as the church, needs to be tough love. Tough love is love, and it's part of living a life of love. 1 Corinthians 5, I wonder what you know of that chapter off the top of your head. Well, you, you probably remember, that's the chapter of the immoral brother. Man has his father's wife, and we go, oh, that's despicable, that's terrible, and it is. It's ungodly, it's wrong, it's sinful. And, and maybe you, you might remember, well, the church was, was almost proud. They really weren't doing anything about it. So that's a sin problem, too. And maybe you remember, well, that's the chapter that Paul really begins to say, look, you got to disfellowship this guy. I didn't use those terms, but that's, that was his point. Get him out of your midst. Get sin out of the camp. A little leaven leavens the whole lump, right? Get him out of there. You say, what does this have to do with love? Well, I would describe 1 Corinthians chapter 5 as a chapter about love. 
tough love, mind you, but it's love. Because if you look at why Paul gives the instructions to get the guy out of your fellowship, he does it to bring him back. He does it so that he will miss the church, miss his brothers and sisters. At one point in the chapter, he would say, don't even eat with the guy. And we're going, man, that's harsh. That must be figurative. It's not figurative. It's quite literal. And what he means is, I want him to miss you and miss your love, so I want you to implement tough love, miss that relationship with you, so that he'll repent and come back and his soul will be saved. So 1 Corinthians chapter 5, that's about tough love. But living a life of love begins no other place than with God because... Love comes from God. Even back in 1 Corinthians chapter, or excuse me, I'm stuck on 1 Corinthians. 1 John 4, 7, beloved, let us love one another for love is from God. You got to bottom line it. You got to start here when we speak of living a life of love and say, and it begins with God. It just does. Okay, let's move on. Secondly, turn to Matthew 22. Let's get into practical application for us, can we? What it means to live a life of love. Matthew 22. When asked, and Jesus was asked by an expert in the law, what's the greatest commandment? Do you remember? What's the greatest commandment? And, and really, it's, it's an interesting question. And um, one that I could see myself asking today, one that I could certainly see our society asking because we want to know who is the greatest, who is the best, who's the best player, what's the best movie, who's the best actress, the best company. We want to know the greatest of the greats. And in essence, this expert of the law questions Jesus in Matthew 22, 36 and following he says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Of all 600 some odd laws, which is the greatest? And you need to understand a little bit of his mindset. His mentality is, if I know what the greatest law is, he's not in any way under the impression that he can keep all 600 whatever, however many number of laws there are, but he thinks, if I know what the greatest law is, I can focus on that law and focus on keeping that, and man, I'm going to be in good shape with God. So I just need to know what the greatest law is, and I don't have to worry about the other however many there are. So he says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. So Jesus says, I want you to love God with everything you can. God should be number one, top of your list priority. It doesn't mean you're not going to fail. It doesn't mean you're not going to make mistakes. But it's not a license to fail. And it's not a license to embrace sin or sinful activities. But he says, I want you to love God with everything you've got. That's what the first and greatest commandment is about. You want to live a life of love, then you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. In Luke chapter 14, I love this verse. Hold your place in Matthew 22. We'll bounce around a little bit. Just kind of follow with me. Jot some notes down, if you will. Since we've been live streaming since March, and we're, we're back in our building for two services on Sunday morning, but my mom is 73, and so she, she lives in Benton, Arkansas, so she just watches our live stream every week is what she does. She hadn't quite gone back to the Northside Congregation in Benton, but she will say to me periodically, you move too fast. I can't always keep up with you. So um, I say, Mom, well, I, I just have a lot of ground to cover, you know. Luke 14 and verse 26 is a great, great verse. Jesus would say, if anyone comes to me and does not hate, we would say to our kids, we don't hate. Just listen to what he says. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And we think, wait a minute. Why would Jesus make such a statement that I want you to hate your father and mother and your wife and your children and, and even your own life? 
Paul said, love your husbands, love your wives. Is this contradictory? Not at all. His point is, I want to be first. I want you to love me more than anyone. And, and here's what I tell, I, here, here's what I say to young couples and sometimes older couples. Listen, you, you really want to be a good husband, you really want to be a good wife, then love God more than your spouse. He needs to come first. Love him more than you love your wife, guys. Love him more than you love your husbands. Your husband, lady, sorry, that didn't come out right. I know you only have one. We're not going to talk about that tonight. So, what it means to live a life of love, well, love God with all your heart. And when I love God with all my heart, He's first. He's the priority. And, I, and I'm the husband I should be. I'm the dad I should be. I'm the brother in Christ or the friend or the neighbor. All of those different hats that we all wear. I'm the person I should be when I, when I have God where He needs to be on the throne of my heart. And I'm loving Him with all of my heart with all of my soul and with all of my strength. But it's interesting in that text in Matthew 22, the expert in the law says, I want to know which is the greatest commandment. And Jesus tells him. But Jesus gives him a little something extra, doesn't he? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. The guy doesn't interrupt. But maybe he's thinking, well, well Teacher, I only ask for the first, you know, the greatest. And Jesus says, the second is like it. It's also very important. Maybe it's 1A, 1B. But it's also important. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And when you think about loving others we got to think about the way Jesus loves us. And I, I, would, I would define, personally, I would define our neighbor as anyone we come in contact with. It's not the person that lives next door to you necessarily, although they are included. Not the person that lives around the corner from you. Or the one you've lived in Moralton with all your life, necessarily. Our neighbor is anybody we come in contact with. He says, I want you to love them more than you love yourself, or the way you love yourself. Okay? So love God with all of your heart, and then love your neighbor as yourself. And so living a life of love is loving one another. If we were to go back to 1 John chapter 4, let me flip back here real fast. 1 John chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Yeah, he says, Beloved, if God so loved us, and he proved it, didn't he? We also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God if we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. It shows by the love we have for one another. In John 13, you're familiar with this passage. In John 13, in verse 34, Jesus would say, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. So the way I've loved you, I want you to love one another. Now here, here's the thing. If to say, I expect you to love one another, that's one thing. And I think we grasp that. I think we understand that concept. But to say, I want you to love one another the way I have loved you, that puts far greater emphasis on it, doesn't it? Because when we think of loving one another the way Jesus loves us, let me explain what that means. That's always and no matter what. He always loves us. He loves us no matter what. And you say, well, you know, there's a time we can fall away from grace. I know that. But explain to me when you fall away from His love. You can fall away from grace. You can turn your back. You can leave the church. I'm not so sure you can fall away from his love. My point is, I'm not so sure he ever stops loving us. In fact, I would teach that he doesn't. And more than anything, he wants us to come back. In John 15, in verse 12, just for the sake of, of another scripture here, he says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. I want you to love one another always, no matter what. I want you to love one another that way. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul would define for us love. In verse 4, when he would simply say, love is patient and love is kind. Both of these, patient and kind, are fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22. He says, this is what love is. If you're, if you're going to live a life of love, it's about displaying the characteristics of love in our daily lives, and that would be patience and kindness. I'm going to tell you something. One of the things our world needs is kindness. And one of the things I've learned over the years, and I've tried to implement and I've tried to practice, especially in front of my kids, is look, you be kind no matter what. And sometimes it's frustrating when we're kind and someone's rude to us. But you know what? I don't know what kind of day they've had. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what kind of home they have. I don't know their story. But my responsibility and your responsibility as people striving to live lives of love is to simply be kind and show kindness. Be patient with others. Again, we're not sure what's going on in their lives. Living a life of love is, is being patient with those who frustrate us. Being kind to everyone we encounter. Living a life of love is, is handling every situation in a loving way. In 1 Corinthians 13, still, verses 1 through 3, Paul would say, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong, clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I have and, and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. So he says, it doesn't matter what you do. And he, and he writes this chapter 13 in the middle of a context about spiritual gifts to a group of Christians at Corinth that are plagued with, this is the imperfect church. And you say, well, I thought our church was. Well, I thought our church was. We all are, aren't we? But certainly Corinth was. And, and problem after problem, but one of the issues they had, and he, he shared, puts 1 Corinthians 13 right smack between 12 and 14, which is where it ought to go, right? To say this. I don't want you worrying about the miraculous abilities and the miraculous gifts that they had then because they were really, the, the early church, especially Corinth, they were, I, I want to speak in tongues. I, they were so enamored with tongue speaking and, and some with prophecy, but mostly tongue speaking. And, and he would say, listen, it doesn't matter if you, can, if you have all of those gifts and if you can speak in tongues or, or you know, know all, all the mysteries and have all the knowledge if you don't have love. And notice how he would wrap this chapter up. He would say, so now, faith, hope, and love abide, but these three, but the greatest is love. So the greatest, the greatest gift in the context of spiritual gifts, he says, is love. And he would even say, hey, in, in verse 8 and following, these gifts that you're so hung up on, the tongue speaking and prophesying, they're all going to come to an end anyway. Man, seek love. That's what I want you to be about. Live for love. John 13, we were there a minute ago when Jesus said, um, I want you to love, the, love one another the way that I love you. We didn't read verse 35 and we should. In verse 35 of John 13, Jesus says, By this, well, let me back up and read 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. So, do, do you really wrap your mind around that? People will know that we belong to God by our love. Let me translate that another way. We are evangelistic when we are loving. Now let me, let me tell you what that may look like. Somebody's rude to you and you, you, you are patient with them and you extend kindness. Somebody cuts you off in traffic and you don't fuss or holler. You just let them go. You say, well, this is really trying my patience. I get it. I get it. We're all human. 
But we're talking about living a life of love. And that's really one of our greatest responsibilities as Christians. We are, you know, evangelism scares everybody. If, if George said, hey, Chuck's coming tonight and he's going to tell us how to do personal evangelism, you're thinking, oh, man, do I want to go. He's going to tell me how to go knock on my neighbor's door and we're going to, no, 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 no. We can be evangelistic by just being loving. When, when we are loving and people see Jesus in us, I'm persuaded that's evangelistic. Because I'm persuaded then they're saying, what is it about this guy? Listen, in this day and age, folks, somebody's always watching. There are no secrets. I mean, surely we get that in this uh, age of social media. So your influence is one of your greatest abilities and gifts. And when it's a, an influence of love, oh, you're constantly pointing people to the Father. That's your, that's your job. That's your responsibility. It's mine as well. But by living a life of love, we are being evangelistic. We are leading others to Jesus because of what they see in us. So living a life of love begins with God. And we've kind of talked about what it means. I've got to love Him more than anything, and then I've got to love my neighbor. I've got to love my neighbor. I've got to love those that are, that are even uh, difficult to love. I've got to love those also. Well, let's spend just a few minutes talking about this last point, and then we'll wrap up. Let's talk about what living a life of love is not. Talk about what it's not. 1 Corinthians 13, one more time. Verses 4 through 6. He says love is patient and love is kind. We talked about that. But then notice where he goes with this definition. He says love does not envy or boast. Love is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails or never ends, depending on your translation. What living a life of love is not. Sometimes I think we are guilty of confusing being loving and being weak or timid. We say, well, you know, Jesus said... Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Matthew 5 and 5. He did say that. But we tend to believe meekness is weakness, but meekness is not weakness. Meekness, by definition, is simply power under control. You can illustrate that in a couple of ways. A sports car, I'm not about driving fast, but a sports car, some of them will go really fast. You've got a sports car that, say, will go 170 miles an hour, and you drive the speed limit at 65. And never gas that thing, never goose it on the interstate, on the straightaway. That's power under control. That's meekness. We sing the song, He Could Have Called 10,000 Angels. You've heard that song for years. That's meekness. That's power under control. Paul said to Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, in verse 7, I love this verse. He says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. So Paul t told Timothy that the spirit of fear doesn't come from God. Okay? So living a life of love isn't being afraid to take a stand for truth and what is right. If ever there was a time for the church to shine, if ever there was a time for the church to, to take a stand, it was today, isn't it? Think about 2020. I'm not talking about the television program. I'm thinking about this year. We're nine months in, aren't we? Roughly. Six months into a pandemic. We could go tomorrow. So last Thursday, Cabot schools let out early because of a hurricane. Are you kidding? You know, I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying that's never happened before in Cabot, Arkansas. The pandemic, the 
riots. We've gone from stay-at-home orders, please stay at home, to protests and riots and people literally on top of each other. Some of them became violent. Some of them were destructive. We've seen just a little bit of everything in 2020. And what I would say is we talk about living a life of love. Sometimes we think love is just quiet and love is so, so weak and, and, and love is, is, is meek. And, and I'm not saying love isn't those things, but love is not just those things. Sometimes love takes a stand. Sometimes love says, you know what, that's not right. Let me show you. Let's look at just a few examples and I'll, I'll let you go home. How about that? Matthew 16, follow with me just for a few minutes. We're almost done. George may have to help me off the stage. I can't believe how bright this is. This is incredible. I, I, maybe I'm used to a dark building and I just feel so illuminated. It's okay, at least I can see up here. Living a life of love isn't being afraid to take a stand for the truth and what is right. Matthew 16, 21 through 23. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. So he's telling them what's going to happen. Peter took him aside. Here's Peter. You know, I love Peter because Peter makes me feel better about Chuck. You know, Peter took him aside. I mean, this is something I'd do probably. And he began to rebuke him. He's going to straighten Jesus out. Really, Peter? Saying, far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But he turned and he said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not seeing your, or setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. So he, he stands up. Jesus kind of digs his heels in a little bit and says, Peter, you're wrong here. You're, you're not getting it. He takes a stand. What about in Matthew 21? Let's just look at one more example. 12 and 13. Jesus entered the temple and he drove out, you know this story, he drove out all who sold and, and bought in the temple and he overturned the tables of the money changers and, and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers? And I mean, do you really, when you see that scene play out in your mind, do you really think Jesus is just kind of knocking stuff off a table? Excuse me, maybe throwing that chair over He's mad. He said, I don't think so. This is not how it's supposed to go. And he takes a stand. So, and we don't look at that text and say, well, you know, Jesus was pretty well out of line there. I think that's the one time we see where Jesus sinned. Well, the Hebrew writer would disagree with you and say that he was tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin, Hebrews 4.15. So he didn't sin. So this is to me, he took a stand for what was right, and that's what you and I have to do. But I think we, we misunderstand. We say, yeah, but I've got to be loving. We Love God first, yes. Love one another, yes. And I've got to do everything out of love, yes. So that means I really can't ruffle the, anybody's feathers. I really can't take a stand. Listen, if you are a parent, surely you know about taking a stand. Because if you don't, your kids will parent you. We got to take a stand. And that's got to also transfer into our spiritual lives. Let me show one more to you if you don't mind. Galatians 2. We'll, we'll end after this. Galatians 2. I like this one a lot. Let's see. Galatians 2, 11 and following. Paul writes, but when Cephas, Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. Sounds confrontational. Well, it was. It was. Because he stood condemned. He was doing the wrong thing. And then Paul explains it. He says, for before certain men came from James, the Jews, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, the Jews came, he drew back from and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. So he says, Peter was, was fellowshipping with the Gentiles. He was all in, and they're having a good time. And the Jews show up, 
show up and he draws back and he's, he's showing uh, a, a hip, hypocrisy basically and he's teaching those around him hypocrisy. In verse 13, the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But it's interesting to me that uh, yeah, Paul would say he opposed Peter to his face. Was it sinful? Was he out of line? Was he wrong? Should he just allowed it to go on? No! That's what the church at Corinth was doing. Man has his father's wife, Paul says. And church, you're proud. Get him out of your midst. He's going to influence everybody else. I'm paraphrasing, but that was, that's the message in 1 Corinthians 5. What's he doing? He's taking a stand. And, and again, that's a chapter on tough love. In my opinion, I believe that. Living a life of love is not going along with and yielding to the vocal minority or the vocal mi majority. We're not just going to go with the flow and say, well, that's what love does. Boy, we're in trouble if that's our mindset. We can take a stand for God, for His church, His word, our convictions, our family, in a loving way. I believe that. Jude wrote his little letter. And his message, I'm paraphrasing, in verse 3 was, you know, I wanted to write you a friendly letter. Talk about our common salvation. But I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith. Stand up for something. We got false teachers that are slipping in, leading people. Astray. I'm paraphrasing, but that was the gist of the message. And the point is, you guys are going to stand up. Living a life of love is not always being silent because you're afraid it's not loving to take a stand. We have to take a stand. We have to live lives of love. We have to love God with all of our heart, soul, and strength. We have to love our neighbor as ourselves. We have to put God first. And we have to show people by our love for one another who, we, who our Father is. The story is told of a young coach. Many years ago, his team is about baseball. His team is about to play. And he is, many coaches as they prepare for their game, he's leaned up against the chain link fence watching the game playing in front of his. These are young kids playing, 10, 11, maybe 12. There's a practice area off behind where the coach was standing, and there's stands over to this side, and fans are screaming, moms and dads, this, this, this game is nearing its end. And all of a sudden, there's a ruckus that takes place in the practice area behind the coach. A dad jumps out of the stands, and he makes his way to the practice area, and a toddler had made his way into the practice area. Well, the practice area is just that. The boys were over there throwing baseballs, getting loose, for the next game. That's what they do in that practice area. Well, the toddler got hit by one of the baseballs. Began to cry as a little one would, and dad heard that, and dad panicked, and dad jumped off the bleachers, ran over, scooped up his child, and he began to let that young ball player have it, saying words that should not come out of anyone's mouth, but certainly in a family atmosphere at a ballpark like that. And the young coach was maybe maybe 21, 22, and he watched this scene unfold. And he turned back to the game thinking, I've got a game to coach. And he turned back and thought, I've got to say something, though. He was a Christian. And he, so he walked over to this guy that's probably 20 years plus older than him, and he said to the dad, hey, how's your, how's your child? He said, well, I think he's okay. But, boy, he's, he's mad. He's fuming. I think he's okay. But those kids, and then here comes some more words. And the young coach stopped him and said, Sir, listen, listen, I'm sorry about what happened to your child, but you can't use that kind of language out here. There are kids all over this place. You can't talk like that out here. And the guy was fuming mad. He said, I tell you what, I know the president of this ballpark. I'm going to go to him. I'll have, you know, all this kind of stuff. So the young coach turned and he walks back to the fence, takes his place. About that time, his player, the players are coming off the field. He's ushering his players to the dugout, getting ready for his game. 
Ten minutes pass, he's preparing to, to walk to the dugout to follow his players, and out of the corner of his eye, he sees this, this dad approaching him. He's thinking, oh, no, now what? And the dad walked over, and he said, um, young man, and he, shook, he stuck his hand down. He said, I want to shake your hand. He said, I want to apologize to you for the way I acted. He said, I was wrong. You were right. And he said, I should have never spoke like that at all. And he said, I was just angry. And the young coach said, hey, that's okay. You know, you, you're a dad. It happens. But all that to say, the young man was very respectful of the, the older gentleman. But the easiest thing to do in that, in that moment is to do what? Turn back. Let's finish the game. Let's hit the dugout. Let's get on the field. None of my business. But the young man took a stand because of who his father is. And he knew, man, this doesn't represent my father well. I got to stand for him. You see, that's what, that's what we got to do when we live a life of love. So let's not, let's not look at love and say, well, love's weak and love's and all these other things. Love's not weak. Love takes a stand. Love, living a life of love, is striving every single day to love God with all I've got and put him first in my life. And it's about loving you more than I love me. And it's about allowing others to see the love of Christ in me by the way that I love you. I hope that makes sense. So what I would say to you, in a difficult time in our country, and it is difficult, it's difficult. It's difficult for you here. It's difficult for us in Cabot. It's difficult. The church looks different. We're not sure how long this is going to last, and we're not sure what things are going to look like when we get back. 100%. But I know who's on the throne, and he's still going to be on the throne when this is over. Let's do our part. Let's stay focused on God. Let's stay engaged with the church, and let's live lives of love. Tonight, I want to offer an invitation. Um, we'll, we'll sing a song, I suppose, and if you have a need, I think you stand. Is that correct, George? And one of the shepherds will get with you and find out what your need is. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. I always love coming here. Take care of George and Gail for me. I love you all. If you have a need, please stand and let the shepherds know at this time as we sing.